We have kept you waiting over long, I fear. Not to worry, Alphano. We had some rather fine mulled wine to keep us company. Truth be told, you could have delayed your arrival a few moments more. Gibrion got the spicing just right this time. His latest batch is not only delicious and warming, but soothing to the humours. Indeed. But it was not to soothe our humours that we gathered here. Ah, oh, no. Quite right. The matter of that poor dragoon. You have discovered something. A means to save him? Let us not jump to conclusions, shall we? Assess the facts presented, then make an educated analysis, as you were taught. Pray, cast your mind back to the moment of Astinian's transformation. Do you recall how you described it to us? You spoke of the sudden pangs which racked his body when you took up both of Nidhogg's eyes, and of how his form was twisted thereafter into a shadowy semblance of the Great Worm. When he appeared at Falcon's Nest, the worm's eyes were fused to his mail. Would that only his armor had been corrupted. Snaking forth from the eyes, I described dark tendrils which entangled his very being. His ether has been all but smothered. Then he is lost to us forever? What did I just say about jumping to conclusions? Yishtola clearly stated all but smothered. As I later discovered, her impression matched my own. Though Nidhogg's presence filled my mind's eye, beneath his seething aura, I sensed the merest hint of something else. And after listening to Yishtola's observations, I became more certain of my suspicion that the something else I had sensed was, in fact, the trace of a different will, submerged in the sea of Nidhogg's rage. You mean? Yes, tis like that Astinian spirit yet lingers. Can we not wrest him from Nidhogg's grasp then? Tear the eyes from the armor? We know not if that would serve to separate Worm's soul from man's. None have ever attempted such a feat. Should it offer even the faintest hope of success, then by the gods, I shall be the first to try. Alpha, no. By all means, hold fast to your hope, but be mindful of the dangers. Even should you succeed in excising the eyes from the dragoon's mail, we have no way of knowing if your friend's soul would survive so violent a separation. And that is to say nothing of the possibility that his would-be saviour might become Nidhogg's next host. But what other choice remains to us? Should the opportunity present itself, I will tear those foul orbs from Astinian's armour and trust in the resilience of his soul, even at the risk of mine own. I found you at last! A messenger of the Temple Knights came to the manor some few hours past. The Lord Commander humbly requests the company of the Warrior of Light and Master Alphano. Sir Emmerich would speak with us. Very well, thank you, Anawa. would seem duty calls. Pray see to yours, and we shall return to ours. Thank you, Yishtola, Kryl. Your words have given me hope where there was none. Come then, Sir Emmerich awaits. Alphano is allowing his feelings for this dragoon to cloud his thoughts. I worry he may do something rash. 
Keep an eye on him, would you? They think more of their friends to the difference than their foes defeat. But will history commend their fealty or condemn their folly? The conference held at Falcon's Nest was to be a celebration of the reconciliation twixt man and dragon. But the lingering shade of Nidhogg, clad in the flesh of the Azure Dragoon, did mark the occasion by spilling the blood of his own kind. A timely atrocity to remind the children of Ishgard that the Dragonsong War was far from over. And when fear gave way to fury, the call to arms rang out anew. Death to Nidhogg. Death to Nidhogg. Friends, I thank you for coming. You have had news of Nidhogg? Alas, not. Our scouts range far and wide, but they have as yet found no trace of the Great Worm. We dispatched an elite unit of Dragoons to reconnoiter the churning mists, but even they returned empty-handed. A pity. Fear not, Alphano. We shall see the worm again soon enough. His words at Falcon's Nest attest to that. Indeed, he is like to come sooner than we would wish. I assume Ishgard's defenses are being bolstered as we speak? With all haste, I mean to call upon every able-bodied warrior at our disposal, from the Knights of the Four Houses to the men and women of the Watch. But I did not summon you to discuss strategy. What then would you have of us, my lord? I will speak plain. Now that Nidhogg is possessed of both of his eyes, no mortal force we can muster will repel him. 
That being the case, we must needs recruit an ally of equal strength. You speak of Hrace, Felga. I do. To whom else could we turn? That he is Nidhogg's equal I do not deny, nor can I name another. But convincing the reclusive creature to do battle with his own brood brother will be... How shall I put this? It will be no small undertaking, yes. Estinian's report was most particular about Hresvelga's unwillingness to involve himself in the affairs of men. But much has changed since your visit to Somal, and if there is even a chance that the dragon may be swayed, I must plead our case. Whatever price the dragon asks of me, I shall pay it. Such was my oath, to defend the people of Ishgard. Come what may, my friends, the battle with Nidhogg will mark the end of my tenure as the acting head of church and state. Will you help me discharge this final duty? We will, my lord, though I fear our involvement offers no guarantee of success. Come then, we will depart at your leisure. Thank you, both of you. The city is yours, First Commander. My lord, we shall pray for your swift return.
trace, Valga. Tis not lightly that we beg this audience. Pray hearken to our words, for they concern the future of man and dragon both. Greetings, Bresvelga. I am Emmerich de Burel, acting ruler of the nation of Ishgard. I am come before you to parley on behalf of my people. Saw mine intent. We understand that in your despair at man's betrayal, you seek only the refuge of solitude. But despite your protestations of spent faith, do you not still nurture the smallest flame of hope? I do. If you claim I see falsely, then tell me. Why did you consent to bear Rizel upon your back? So you do distinguish between those who acknowledge and repent their sins and those who perpetuate them. Interesting. It seems to me that you have not, in fact, lost faith in mankind as a whole. Rather, you weigh our respective merits by how we allow the past to influence our future. Should we suffer ties of blood to bind our hands, then? Nay, if the crime is one of unconscionable evil, we must needs condemn it, even should the transgressor be our closest kin. When my father corrupted himself and his followers with the power of a primal, I beseeched the warrior of light to slay him, an act alike to patricide. That he did not die by my hand matters little. If anything, it heaps greater disgrace upon my name. 
But had my father not fallen, he would have drawn countless thousands into a holy war of hellish proportions, which I hold the greater crime. Thus did I order his execution, sparing the lives of my people and yours. Alas, your brother Worm now prepares to murder those whom I sought to spare. What is more, he has taken my comrade's body for his own. But if I must slay my dearest friend to defeat my direst foe, I will not flinch from my duty. Sekmon in film, Seskan is Ekmon, Kiel in Ud. Sloskna, Dürkin Ilves, Kolhes. Es geht es geht an, er in an, es nicht an, es geht Thank <laughs> you. 